Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Pellan, Chief Executive at the RSI. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's special lunchtime event. Um, we're filming and live streaming today's discussion, so hello and welcome to everyone joining us online. And a reminder, the hashtag is RSA Internationalism, if you'd like to get involved with the conversation on Twitter. I'm pl pleased to be joined today by Lisa Nandy, MP for Wigan since 2010 and current candidate for leadership of the Labour Party, to discuss Britain's place in a changing global context in the years to come. How can we ensure a meaningful and active role for the UK on the international stage post-Brexit and work cooperatively with the EU and wider global partners to address major geopolitical challenges? We're pleased to have been approached by Lisa and her team to host an event here. As many of the themes uh, I think you're going to cover tie in with the RSA's mission as an organisation to unite people and ideas to resolve the challenges of our time from the local level to the global. Now, I need to emphasise the RSA is an independent organisation. We don't endorse any political party or any candidate. I thought I'd remind you of the last seven people that I have introduced from this stage. Uh, they are Nicola Sturgeon, Theresa May, John McDonnell, Andrea Ledstrom, Nick Clegg, Caroline Lucas and Michael Gove. There is a theme there, but it's too deep for me to reveal. Um, and we've uh, invited those people because we want to understand the social, economic, technological, environmental forces and the way in which our political class and lead society address those questions. Um, so for us at the RSA, the changing global context has implications for all the big issues that we talk about here, how to create more prosperous towns and cities, the importance of the climate change challenge, the future of work in an age of automation. And I'm sure we'll pick up on some of those themes uh, as our discussion uh, develops. Uh, so uh, I'm going to hand over to Lisa. She's going to speak. We'll have a bit of a Q&A on the stage. We will open up to our friends from the press, but we will make sure there's enough time uh, for you as well to ask your questions before we finish uh, at two. So enough from me. Before uh, Let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Nanda. Thanks very much, Matthew, and thank you to the RSA for hosting this at very short notice. I think this is what happens when you launch a leadership bid to lead the Labour Party back to power with only a few weeks' notice, that you ring up the RSA and say, I'd like to come and make a speech tomorrow, and they say, of course. <laughs> and it's the mark of a good institution that they do. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do this here, and I wanted to do it today and with Matthew and others, is because the RSA is one of those institutions that is genuinely not just thoughtful and outward looking but challenging and this is the moment for labor i think when we need to up our game and challenge some of the assumptions that we've held on in the past we've been losing for a long time now we haven't won a majority for 15 years and if we play it safe and take a business as usual approach as i said when we launched in dagenham a few days ago labor will die and it will deserve to but there is a better future on offer. And today I want to focus on internationalism, one of those areas where in the Labour Party we often are proud to say that we have a proud internationalist history and we are a proud internationalist party. But now at this critical moment as Britain leaves the European Union, I want to ask what does that mean? Because in recent years the question of internationalism has been reduced to a discussion on the left that can be reduced to one simple question. EU in or out. It's polarised the country, most of whom had much more complex, nuanced views on EU membership and EU structures than this reductionist debate would have us believe. So we were unable to hear those Leave voters who thought that close international cooperation was important, or those Remain voters who disliked some of the decisions and the direction that the EU had taken. Complexity was airbrushed from the debate, and we were unable to have an honest conversation about what needed to change, left defending what was, not being truthful with the public about how we would build better and more democratic cooperation with our closest neighbours. How could it be that Labour, a radical force for change that has only won three times in our history, when we've had an ambitious story to tell about the future of Britain and our place in the world, how could it be that we were on our back foot defending the status quo? One of the key problems with the referendum was that it failed to tell a story about our place in the world. 
Leave campaigners said that we were a small nation with a proud history of punching above our weight. Remain campaigners said, we'll cut your mobile phone roaming charges. <laughs> and set against the seismic changes that are happening in the world beyond Europe, we didn't give any serious thought to what Britain's place in that world should be. Three and a half years later, we're still on the back foot. We've allowed the right to frame the debate into a series of false binaries and in doing so allowed a fully fledged culture war to be unleashed. The trap was set. You can be for your country or you can be for the world. And senior Labour politicians rushed headlong into it. It was a serious failure of leadership. I know that the truth is more complicated than that. My Remain voting friends are no more liberal elites than my Leave voting neighbours are racist little Englanders. And if we fail to recognise the validity of views on different sides of a debate, we let everybody down together. Winning the argument for a confident, open internationalist country will take leadership. Thinking big, playing, not playing it safe, understanding that the referendum was a call for much more power and control and that the response should never have been reduced solely to a technocratic debate about single market membership and the rights or wrongs of a customs union. And now that we're leaving the EU, our response to the referendum should be that moment. For Labour to reframe and to restate our commitment to internationalism and Britain's place in the world, we need to seize this moment and we need to set out what we want this country to be. And I want to set out today how, under my leadership, Labour would do so and in doing so, how we would set ourselves back on the road to power. The world is a complex place with power structures and forces that govern it constantly evolving and throughout history internationalism has evolved with it internationalism is the determination to solve global problems collectively and in to improve the lot of workers and citizens through cooperation and solidarity these are the challenges an internationalist meet must meet but they change with every single generation in the 1920s the league of nations was formed with the principal mission to maintain world peace in the wake of two world wars the end of the 40s saw the formation of NATO and the UN, the main stalwarts of multilateral intervention and diplomacy across the world still today. In the 1950s and 60s, Europe's retreat from empire, the civil rights struggle by oppressed sections of societies, and the rise of feminism as a distinctive and powerful voice all contributed to seismic change in geopolitics and global society. And today, activists all over the world campaign together to warn against the dangers of climate change and complacency of governments across the globe. And for all, all the fear and insecurity in those decades, what runs through this like a silver thread is the rich history of international solidarity of workers throughout. But today we face a different but very real challenge. Internationalism itself is under attack as it has become associated with membership of the global liberal elite. As Theresa May so shamefully said in her speech to the Conservative Party conference in 2016, if you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. There are voices calling for us to turn inwards, just as America First and Make America Great Again have found resonance with so many people across the US. There are those here who maintain that a retreat into narrow nationalism will help resolve the problems we face. As if the sovereignty of our nation can be defined in aggressive opposition to its closest neighbours. But Labour has always stood for solidarity between nations, a solidarity based not on expedience but on values. Solidarity which at times we've been prepared to and had to go out and fight to defend. And in a world that's more interconnected than ever before, where many of the problems that we face are global in nature, it can only be that way. But we stand for this not just because it's a means to an end, but because it matters in its own right. Because we believe that through solidarity with one another, people across the world rise up together. Take the Indian cotton pickers and the Lancashire cotton mill workers of the 1930s, for example. This is a story that is deeply personal to me and to my family history, standing together in solidarity at great personal cost. Or the young people I met during the Arab Spring who put everything on the line to fight for freedom. It wasn't the hope that freedom would come that kept them going, they didn't know if it would. It was more the certain knowledge of what life was like without it. 
And the bravery of those young people convinced me that we cannot allow our values to drift. The world is complex and interlinked, but important principles may and must be inflexible. And that is the difference for me between my party and the Tories. Our values permeate internationalism, whereas their values appear to be negotiable. But we must acknowledge then that in recent times we have failed to infuse our internationalism with the values that we believe in. Russia is a regime that discriminates against LGBT people. It demonises Muslims and other minorities and suppresses basic rights. It's invaded its neighbour and occupied a chunk of its sovereign territory. It's used chemical weapons on the streets of the UK and murdered a homeless person. It was completely wrong that our response to this was to cast doubt on what happened and call only for dialogue. At a crucial moment, we hesitated in condemning an authoritarian regime that supports Donald Trump, that invades its neighbours, that steals its country's wealth, that interferes in elections in Europe and America, that attacks minority communities, and then used chemical weapons on the streets of the UK. We stood with the Russian government and not with the people it oppresses who suffer poverty and discrimination. We failed the test of solidarity. And as a result, we let the Tories get away with their own shocking weakness on Putin's Russia, suppressing the ISC report, failing to answer basic questions on their own funding by Russian oligarchs, letting the city of London become a paradise for corrupt money laundering. The Labour leadership failed on Russia, and we must put this right. And with the climate change crisis, the Labour Party is the right political movement in this country to lead the way. We know the threat this poses to the security of the world, and we know that it can only be solved by global cooperation on a truly ambitious scale. But we care about this not just because of the impact on GDP and investments, as real as that is, or because solving the challenge holds out the offer of a growth industry in the UK. We care because whether you're a victim of a flood, fire or drought, we know that in countries across the world it is the working classes and the poor who suffer most and suffer first. And we know that addressing this takes more than protest. It takes leadership. This is what defines Labour's internationalism. Internationalism that sees the world as it is and is clear-eyed about the challenges it faces, but is steadfast regardless in our commitment to build a better world and to preserve it for the generations to come. To live up with, to this commitment, we need more than just dreams. We need a plan. And that plan must take people with us. There was a moment... I believe, following the referendum result in 2016, where a national conversation on what would come next after we left the EU was possible. A genuine conversation that could see Leave and Remain voters come together to define what was important and to set a course for the UK that they could stand behind. Not perfect for any, but better for all. And because of that, the hardest path of all. But we missed the moment. We didn't try and the lesson from history is that the path of least resistance has never pointed towards progress. A hundred years ago this year, the League of Nations was formed. At its peak, the British branch had over 400,000 members, people committed to the ideals of peace, international justice and collective security. The League had many flaws and its history is largely written off as one of failure, but its successes should never be overlooked. Critically, it shows that human nature is rich enough to support an ideal that looks beyond our own horizons. And the movement behind the League of Nations was what created the space for a future Labour government to create the international infrastructure that survives to this day. This year we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. It has its own problems, of course, but it has endured through the Cold War, the rise of China, the rebuilding of Japan and the decline of the European empires. And it survives to this day, built, negotiated and agreed by a Labour government, defended by successive Labour governments. That is what Labour governments do and must do again. Where is that movement for the 21st century? One that can work together within the international architecture we have and help breed life into those institutions built to meet the challenges of a different era. In a world where too many leaders are cynically playing to domestic audiences, that has contributed to the escalation of tension with Iran, a progressive Labour government with a role in the UN Security Council, the OSCE, the Security Council, and strong 
European partnerships would be part of an international alliance that rebuilds conflict prevention and international cooperation. In a world where financial transactions worth billions of pounds can be moved at the flick of a switch, where climate events in one part of the world directly affect the lives of people in another, we can build an international system people feel is much less remote and much more immediate than they felt about the European Union. Labour has to light that path by thinking bigger and on a more global scale. As we step out of the framework that has de defined our international engagements for over four decades, where will our new alliances be forged? Which countries are interested in a rules-based international order and want to join our fight to tackle inequality and to tackle climate change? How and where can we use the skills, the expertise and the standing that Britain has to bring this cooperation to life? These are the questions that I pose to our Labour movement as we consider the biggest question of all, not just who should be our leader, but what kind of leadership do we need in the 21st century? We should be putting our efforts into developing good and deep relationships with those countries, whether Canada, Japan or New Zealand, and with the African Union as well. Not focusing solely on free trade agreements, but exploring how intergovernmental cooperation can be broad and productive, and how our joint participation in those multilateral organisations, the G7, the G20, can be brought to life through new alliances and partnerships. The focus on the EU, inevitable as it has been, has squeezed out that thinking. For all the talk of global Britain, we're at risk of retreating to an idea of a British Empire 2.0, not embracing the world and its challenges as they are now. And this is a huge challenge, and one we face at a time when in many places the principles of internationalism are in retreat. We will have to convince people that this is the right path, looking outwards, not in working with others to be more than the sum of our parts, and balancing the need for international cooperation with a strong desire for much more sovereignty and control. To convince people we're up to this task, we'll, we need to be honest and upfront that no institutional, uh, international institution is perfect, and the results of international cooperation will sometimes be messy and they'll be flawed. But that nonetheless, the benefits will outweigh those downsides if we get this right. We should have been bold enough to defend free movement and the opportunities and benefits that it brings. But this would have required recognising that it has flaws and not dismissing concerns about the operation of free movement as simply racist anti-immigration sentiment. We should acknowledge that over decades, successive governments have used the steady influx of skilled labour to cover up a lack of investment in skills and training in the UK and we should address this. I believe in free movement. Let me be clear about that. I've always been honest with my constituents and I will be honest with the country. If it were paired with renewed and radical investment that enabled opportunities for young people, decent jobs, training and skills, then I know that those concerns about free movement would have fallen away. And I worry that over the last decades we've lost our ambition and we've lost our boldness. The legacy of the Iraq war still hangs over the Labour Party like a shadow. But before that disastrous decision to intervene in Iraq was the ethical foreign policy of Robin Cook and the life-saving intervention in Sierra Leone. And we must now have the confidence to move forward, not to shy away from facing the mistakes that we've made, but understanding that Labour has always been the party of ambition and reform. We aren't afraid to stand up and be counted. If we find ourselves the defenders of the status quo, unable, willing, unable to rock the boat, something has gone seriously wrong. We must show that we're willing to live our values and stand by them, even when they have economic consequences or when we have to call out the behaviour of one of our closest allies. We can't turn up at the G20 and pledge our commitment to the Paris Agreement while continuing to use government money to invest in fossil fuel projects overseas or export plastic waste to dump it in Southeast Asia. As we look forward to forge new trading alliances across the world, we'll need to make choices. We should be clear now that we would refuse to agree any trade deal with a country that has not ratified the Paris Agreement. We must use trade to support climate action, not hamper it. 
It's easy to blame Trump as a single destabilizing force, but the UK shouldn't rest on this as an excuse for lack of action on a global level. In a crucial year when we'll host a crunch UN climate summit for the first time, now is the time to step up. Labour, its activists, its councillors and the movement we've built brims with ideas and energy about how we can tackle difficult issues that are common, whether you're in Wigan or in Washington. And as Labour's Shadow Energy Secretary, I was privileged to attend COP21 and witness the agreement of that landmark Paris agreement. But it was mayors from major cities across the world, including our own here in Britain, who were driving this change, not just world leaders alone. And we should be willing to take this energy and the spirit of all our people across the country to revitalise our participation in the G7 and the G20. It's surely Labour, with its history of international solidarity, trade unions, cooperative movements, who can bring ideas for collective action, whether we're talking about tackling inequality, terrorism, tax evasion or climate change. There is a false divide between local and international action. But as CLR James once said, genuine internationalism must be based on the national scene. At crucial times in world's history, Labour has stood up and sought to lead the way. It was a Labour government that committed to international development funding of 0.7% of GDP, and it was a Labour government that built the expertise in state-to-state -state support that is still seen as world-class today. And I seek permission to lead a Labour government that would take this expertise and push the UN Security Council to broaden its support to war-torn countries, to coordinate and deliver support across governance, aid and security combined. Uniquely, the UK has so much to offer across each, but it's only by bringing them together that we can drive the deep, fundamental, lasting change the world needs. In recent years, as you may know, I've committed myself to the challenges facing towns here in the UK. But if we don't make the link between what happens in Bolton and what happens in post-industrial towns across the world, we force internationalism into irrelevance. These are challenges that we can meet. Labour is not yet in power, but we should never believe that we are powerless. Just as Democratic and Republican mayors stood up for the Paris Agreement and stood up to Trump, I will lead a team of Labour mayors and local leaders to lead the way on climate action in the UK and contribute to international action. The Labour I lead will lead by example. We don't have to wait for a Labour government to act. We are already in power in many towns and cities across the UK and I want to use that power to show what Labour can do. We can take the experience and efforts of trade unions in fighting the worst of labour market practices today and take that to build global consensus, ultimately to improve working conditions not just here but across the world. We can understand how extremism is allowed to develop and work at a global level to keep us safe while working locally to build a confident, empowered country where people's better instincts can thrive. I've fought for the rights of migrant workers in the UK all my life and unlike Boris Johnson, I know that the so-called Red Wall communities do too, because I live there. And these aren't just voters to me, these are my friends, my family, my neighbours and my constituents. And that is because my values run through the internationalism that I aspire to and that Labour must too. They are the values which define my commitment to the Labour Party and which must form the keystone of the red bridge that Labour in opposition will build to connect towns and cities across the UK. And the red bridge that we'll build in government too, to connect nations to one another. These are my values, Labour values, our country's values. A new Labour internationalism for the new age, a Labour vision for global Britain, for peace, for the planet, for prosperity, and most of all, for people. The Labour Party I lead will move on from arguments over Iraq and Brexit to set out a new role in the world, defending British interests and building a better world. This is the country I know we can be. We can be better than this. It's the country that I've believed in all my life, but never quite seen. It's within touching distance. I can see it and I can almost feel it. And we will win this if we build it together. Thank you.
Um, so, Lisa, that was fantastic. There was so much in there. I started off with four questions and I've got 20, but don't worry, I'm not <laughs> going to ask them all. Um, <clears throat> so, first question is, the, the very decision uh, to make a speech about internationalism is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide, I, mean, I know you're speaking about lots of issues, but you obviously put a lot of work into this, a lot of thought into this. It, it's not traditionally kind of the set of issues which drive people to vote one way or another, locally or nationally. Now, Brexit has changed that, but, but tell me why internationalism is so important to you. Uh, why is international? You weren't listening to the speech. No, I was. <laughs> but I'm asking, I suppose I'm asking you, I suppose I'm asking you, that's a fair point. I've uh, taken 20 minutes. I, sp I suppose I'm asking you a slightly more kind of cynical question, which is almost tactically, why is it important? Because obviously it's important, but... Why do you think it's an important political statement for you as part of your, uh, your campaign? Because I think this is the moment for Labour where we either think big and look outwards and paint with bold brush, brush strokes or we're finished. And one of the examples of that that I would give you is Scotland where we've been defeated by nationalists over and over again. And if we're honest, we don't have the answers about how to solve this. And so what's happened is a collapse inwards uh, and an internal argument about how we resolve this when actually we should be lo looking outwards to the world for answers. You know, there aren't huge, huge numbers of places where hope has defeated division um, and where social justice has defeated divisive nationalism. But there are times, moments in history where that has happened in places like Catalonia and Quebec we should be looking outwards to the world for those answers, not inwards to ourselves. And I think that's the sort of Labour Party that I believe in and that I haven't seen for some time and the sort of Labour Party that I want to lead. And I've been in despair, I suppose, over the last few years about how we accepted the framing of the Brexit debate as simply one where you picked a side and fought it out and crushed one another. When what we should have been doing is thinking seriously about how do we defend our place in the world? What sort of country do we believe that we are? These big questions just got completely swept off the agenda because we accepted the very, very narrow terms of the debate. And as we move forward at this moment, this is the critical question. How are we going to be, for example, the sort of country outside of the European Union with the type of trade deal that Boris Johnson wants to pursue, with countries like the US, which have much lower workplace standards, is Labour going to be on the back foot just simply trying to protect and preserve a few of those historic achievements, the minimum wage, maybe hang on to some of our health and safety laws or our environmental protections? Or is Labour going to get on the front foot and think, how do we remain competitive in a world in which we're doing trade deals with countries that have much lower standards? How do we protect those standards? How do we do both? And the answer to me on that, I think looks a lot like skills. There's a reason that the northeast car industry may survive, despite the fact that the Tories are currently taking an, a sledgehammer to our international relationships with other EU partners, and that is because that skills base doesn't exist in other parts of the European Union. Investing in our young people here at home has got to be part of the answer to that question. And that's, I suppose, what I was trying to get out in the speech about connecting the local with the global. Labour can't afford to choose the country or the world. We have to do both. So uh, if you're elected, you will be immediately faced with what will probably be one of the big issues of this year, which is this trade deal, and uh, whether or not we want to be more inclined towards a Norwegian model or a Canadian model. What's your kind of view of that, and do you even think Labour should get involved? In a sense, you could argue that Labour's involvement in the Brexit debate so far hasn't done it much good, so maybe... The, the maybe the attitude of the leader of the opposition should be to stand back and say to Boris, well, you, you kind of get on with it and I'll judge you for it, but I don't have to have a position myself. Yeah. Or do you have a view about the kind of trade deal we should have? Well, I have a view about the sort of trade deal we should have, and it's been the, the trade deal that I've been fighting for for the last three years that's pitted me both against my own constituents, many of whom would like to leave with no deal at all, and against my party's leadership, um, which was opposed to... Uh, serious negotiations to achieve that trade deal over the last few years and it's been a it's been a tough tough fight really to try and get people to accept that a soft brexit was the compromise i believe in a close economic relationship with the european union i've always believed in it i believe in a close political relationship with the european union 
And there was a moment when that would have been possible earlier this year, when Theresa May, last year, when Theresa May was the, was the Prime Minister, there was a moment when the door was open to that briefly. It took her two years, but she opened that door and we should have forced it open and taken that deal. By the time she resigned, she, was, she had finally accepted that that had to be a negotiation with the Labour Party and that there had to be guarantees about what happened in those trade talks next and we should have taken that moment. But the truth is that this is now largely irrelevant. We've rendered ourselves irrelevant because we didn't seize any of those moments over the last few years. And but it's up to Boris Johnson now. He's got a huge majority and it's up to him what happens next. We can and we should be forging alliances with other political parties who share our belief that the path that he set us on is disastrous and we should be seeking to defend um, the rights, the protections that we've fought for for 100 years in the Labour movement. But I suppose the, the thing that I really wanted to say today is that that is not sufficient in and of itself. Labour in opposition, fighting, in retreat, fighting to defend a few of the things that we've achieved before, this has never been good enough. And so one of the things that I think we ought to do is think about the realities of the world that we're now in. Boris Johnson has set himself on a path where we'll be leaving the EU within a year with the loosest possible agreement. It looks like some kind of free trade agreement under WTO terms with the EU. And then he will seek to do a trade deal with the US, which they're open to. I think we need to be thinking a bit bigger about what these trade deals actually do and what they look like. Essentially, what we've got at the moment is free trade, bilateral free trade agreements that are quite clunky, they're quite outdated, they focus almost entirely on agriculture. What they don't do, actually, is deal with the sort of trade that we currently have. So if you take Rolls-Royce, for example, Rolls-Royce, when they sell engines, 80% of the profit that they make tends to come from service agreements, not the engines themselves. So there are better pluralistic models of trade that where you, groups of countries could come together and agree that on services, for example, that we trade on similar terms, where you could see the UK doing much, much better and thinking about the industries of the future, not just the industries that we currently have or the industries of the past. I think that's the sort of challenge that I want to lay down to our movement. And that's the sort of challenge that as Labour leader I would want to lay down to the Prime Minister. What, what is their vision? For the future of this country because at the moment we're wedded to a model of trade that is just not serving our interests of the nation and over the last few years one of the things that's pained me the most is seeing the Tories sounding like the people who are most ambitious for the future of our country but I know that we can do better than this and that's what I want to see the Labour Party become again. You talked a bit about kind of interventionism so you know it's a pretty complex issue um, I supported Blair on Iraq and I think I was wrong, uh, but I opposed Ed Miliband and thought we should have intervened in Syria and I think I'm still think I was right. What's your kind of instinct on interventionism? Um, so before I came into Parliament, I worked with refugee families and um, because of that, because of that experience and perhaps because of my instincts, I've never felt uh, that we go it alone. The sort of values I was outlining in the speech, I think we have a duty to step in and protect people, defend people across the world. We stand with those people, not necessarily with their governments, but with those people. And I think Britain has an obligation to the world. So I'm not a pacifist, although, of course, like everybody in this room, I suspect that I would strive towards peace, and that's where my instincts lie. But peace isn't always achieved by taking the easy path, and sometimes you have to stand up to be counted. I think two things, really, about intervention that's been very formative for my experience. I was... I think I was 21 years old when the Iraq war happened. And I marched against Iraq. I, worked for, I was working as a housing caseworker for a member of parliament at the time who was one of the few to vote against Iraq. And um, I think Labour has been very, very scarred by that experience. And I think that we found it very difficult to move on. And I know that in the minds of many colleagues when we were voting on intervention in Libya and in Syria, that that was very raw and very real. But I think we, we do the world a disservice if we don't recognise that there are times when you stand up and times when you don't. The second thing I would say about that, and one of the ways it shaped my, my thinking, is that at the time of the Iraq war, it's forgotten now, but the public were in favour. And the Member of Parliament I worked for, Neil Gerrard, it was a very, very tough call 
to vote against the Iraq war. You weren't just going up against your own party, but you were going up against the public as well. And I think, broadly speaking, the public accepted the Iraq war at the time because they felt that there was an imminent threat and that we were acting in accordance with international law, that there was no alternative, there was nobody else who was going to step in, and that Britain had to do this. And that, broadly speaking, allies with my principles, that you respect the international rule of law. One of the reasons I've been very troubled about what has happened in Iran um, and the order by the US president to murder Soleimani is not because I shed lots of tears for Soleimani. I broadly share Boris Johnson's view on that. But I've been very troubled by the way in which the UK government has been completely unable to articulate the basis on which the US took that action. Was it legal? I don't know. I'm not best placed to judge, but I would expect our Prime Minister to be able to do that because one of the things that has led to this enormous breach of trust between Labour and the people during Iraq was the fact that people trusted us and they believed that there was a basis for that action and when they later found out that there wasn't, the implications of that have lasted for decades. And that's why people like me have been saying to Boris Johnson, come before Parliament, explain to us what you know, what questions you've asked of the US. Do you know that this was legal? On what basis was that action taken? We can't just blindly follow on with the actions of someone that we've always said is one of our closest allies without actually being a challenging partner in that relationship. Two, only two more questions. I, I can see the journalist getting at you. Um, talking about kind of open wounds in the Labour Party, a international issue which has been very connected to internal wounds has been the issue of Israel. And I'm interested in your position on the Israel-Palestine question and whether you think that getting that position clear and right is part of what has to be done in relation to the anti-Semitism crisis that the Labour Party has had. So I've been um, vice chair and then chair of Labour Friends of Palestine in the Middle East for seven years now. And that I took up that position uh, after travelling to the West Bank as a new MP and meeting um, both Israelis and Palestinians who are trying to work with enormous bravery across the divide to solve a real crisis. And it's a crisis that actually has only got worse in the time that I've spent in Parliament. And one of the things I learned, not just from that trip, but then in all the work that I've done since, is that part of the reason we're stuck and we're unable to proceed in negotiations is because there is... Um, no equality of power. It was one of the reasons why I and many colleagues fought and with the support of Ed Miliband won a vote in Parliament to recognise the right of um, the state of Palestine because unless you recognise the state of Palestine you cannot get round a table and talk with any equality of power and any hope of achieving a resolution. But it's also one of the reasons why in the last few years I've been so desperately ashamed of where the Labour Party has ended up because, you know, the obvious and open anti-Semitism is something that I've talked about and many of us have talked about as well and something our failure to deal with that has been very shameful. But also the failure to demand uh, that we defend the right of Israel to exist. And it is one of the reasons that I feel very strongly about that is because that is the moral and the right thing to do. Israel has a right to exist. And there is a deep and a long and a painful history that has led to the founding of Israel and we should be mindful of that and we should always, always speak up in its support. But also because if you want to solve this crisis, if you want to really resolve this issue for those Palestinian children that I met and that I gave my word to seven years ago, that I would do everything that I could to improve their lives and bring an end to this conflict, if you want to resolve this, then you have to stand up for the right of Israel to exist. Just as Brexit became a zero-sum game, a series of false binaries, we should be striving for both. And the commitment to the two-state solution, I accept that this has got much more difficult. I accept that the reality on the ground is making that prospect seem even more distant. But the reason why I have always stood up and defended a two-state solution is because that is the only solution. And Labour must never be defeatist and accept that we pick a side. We don't pick a side, we work together in the common and the national and the international interest in order to achieve peace for both. So finally, um, moving away from internationalism, uh, 
the 2015 Labour leadership campaign was basically kind of three continuity candidates versus a change candidate. And the continuity candidates were quite difficult to tell apart, and the change candidate was very, very different and won. In a sense, this leadership campaign feels like there's one continuity candidate and you know, three or four change candidates. But in a sense, the same issue applies, which is how do those candidates who, who think there needs to be change in the party, that it needs to perhaps move back more to the mainstream, whatever phrase we want to use, how, how do they differentiate themselves? So how do you differentiate yourself, not from Rebecca Long-Bailey, which I guess would be fairly straightforward to do, given what she's said so far, but how do you distinguish yourself from the other candidates who, like you, are saying Labour's got to ask itself the toughest questions, look in the mirror, appeal to the people we've lost touch with? That whole kind of diagnosis is pretty common between you, I'd have thought. What is the distinction, the fundamental distinction about your, your candidacy? Well, can I say, first of all, that I'm not very interested in differentiating myself from the other candidates. When we set out to do this, it wasn't in any sense because I have been desperate to become leader of the Labour Party since I was seven years old. I can tell you now that I haven't. I've always wanted... What did you like, want to be when you were seven years old? <laughs> I think I wanted to be a baker, oh, right, okay. actually. <laughs> and I can't quite remember why. Um, I can't cook, by the way, so this was... Um, so I went into politics. Right. Um, no, I wanted to change the world, I but I wanted to play a part in it. And I've never been arrogant enough to assume that one person is enough. One person is not enough. And one of the mistakes that Labour has made over recent years is to believe that we can simply change the guy at the top and somehow this will fix all our problems. There's this idea that somehow, if only the leader had enough charisma, if only the leader was smart, if only the leader got on with the mainstream media that somehow everything would change for us but the problems that we've got as a Labour Party are much much deeper and fundamental than that and these are the things that I've been grappling with for a decade in Parliament and there are things that need to be said and need to be done in order for us to change and I believe that we need a different sort of leadership the sort of leadership that can build teams of good empowered confident people broad teams that have reach into the country that can hear what people are telling us in very, very different communities and very, very different walks of life and can bring that back and give it voice and give it shape and give it life and give it hope. And that is the sort of leadership that I haven't seen during my time in Parliament for all of the strengths of the different leaders that we've had. The last time that we tried to do that in the Labour Party, I think, has been about... It was when I was a teenager. And... That is the sort of leadership that, if you look around the world, is making waves and is changing the world. It isn't, frankly, Macron standing in the Elysee and lecturing the people of Paris. It's people like Jacintha Ardern, who's getting her sleeves rolled up and going out there and making waves and hearing what people are saying and then stepping in and opening the door to that change. And that's the sort of change that is lasting, that takes people with you, that empowers people to be the people that they can be. And that's the sort of change and the sort of leadership that I've been part of in everything that I've ever done, whether that's in Parliament or outside of it too. And I'm not in this contest because I believe that I need a focus group to differentiate myself from the other candidates an inch ahead by telling either the party or the country what they want to hear. I'm in it because I believe that this is a moment when we can and we must step up and we must change and we must look outwards to the country. And that road back to power, I know it's going to be steep. I've been warning for some time to colleagues in other parts of the country that in parts of the world like Wigan, you can feel the ground shaking beneath your feet. And that Thursday when the election result came in, it wasn't just shaking, the entire base crumbled beneath us. But that that crumbling of that base, that was, it was shattering, it was devastating, but it was as much about Labour as it was about anything else. There is a vacuum there waiting to be filled and people are looking to us to fill it. And that's why I say that the road back to power, it may be steep, but it doesn't have to be long. And I think there is a real prospect of a Labour government in five years' time, the sort of radical but credible Labour government that I tried to outline today and... That's why I'm here, and that's why I'm doing this. Great. Let's have some questions from our friends from the press. So just hands from journalists first, and then I can take them from the rest of the room. So let's go right to the corner of the room. We might, there's a mic coming towards you. 
Hi, Ashley Calvin from The Independent. Um, Saudi Arabia executed 184 people last year, the highest since records began, and the Saudi-led coalition's airstrikes are responsible for thousands of deaths. Is this a regime the UK should remain close to? And is it appropriate for the UK to continue licensing arms to Saudi Arabia? Um, so I'll just be really quick about this. No, it's not appropriate. And I am one of the many Labour MPs who has stood up and made that case repeatedly <coughs> in the House of Commons. And I have to say, actually, that privately there were many Tory ministers who agreed with us. So it is shameful to the UK that action hasn't been taken to stop that, and we ought to. Uh, yeah, bring the... Uh, to the late... late yeah, right. Sam Lister, Daily Express. Um, you were very clear about your belief in the benefits of free movement and also your desire for a very close relationship with the EU. Could a Lisa Nundy government of the future go to Brussels and offer free movement in return for a closer trade deal? Um, so I was one of the first, I would think I was the first Labour MP to come out and say that la if you cast your mind, it feels like it's been a long 12 months, doesn't it? But if you cast your mind back to 12 months ago when Theresa May was Prime Minister and Labour had six key tests that our front bench had, had set down for the Tories and we later dropped one of those, but the sixth was about ending free movement. And I think I was the first Labour MP to come out publicly and say that we needed to drop that commitment to ending free movement. And there were two reasons that I did it. One, genuinely, I don't believe that it is the right thing to do. I think that one of the lessons from Labour government is that we, um, uh, from Labour in opposition, is that we lose our way when we try to pretend somehow that our values are not our values. When we put immigration slogans on mugs, rather than going out and making the case that we believe in compassion, tolerance, decency towards people from other countries, and that we also believe very, very strongly that the world benefits from people being able to move and travel and live and marry who they want. And so I was one of the first Labour MPs to come out and say that, and I said it too because it was always going to come down to a choice in negotiations with the EU between whether we had access to the single market and we were in a customs union, or whether we were ending free movement. And we are the Labour Party. We believe in jobs. We believe in decent employment. We believe in industry. We believe in all of those things. And I believe very strongly, and I still believe that Labour had to be clear about that and had to be honest with people about the reality of the situation that we faced. But this argument about what, what a Labour, future Labour government would do to try and negotiate a trade deal with the EU, I mean, we are so far away from this now I'm not sure that we've absorbed the enormity of what has just happened. Boris Johnson won a huge majority on one slogan, get Brexit done. And we are leaving the EU and we're leaving with the loosest of all arrangements. What a Labour government does in the future to try and repair the damage that that has done, that, that is up for grabs and that is to be negotiated. But there is an immediate, much more immediate task at hand for the Labour Party and that is to think seriously about how we remain a competitive nation in a world where we don't trash all of the labour rights and protections that we have achieved over the last 100 years. Yep. Gentleman with the glasses. Hi, Oliver Milne from the Daily Mirror. Um, it was a quick one. Your speech contained a defence of liberal interventionism, um, and you highlighted Sierra Leone as an example. You voted for strikes against ISIL in Iraq, and against them in Syria. So sort of within that kind of panoply, going from Iraq on one end is bad, Syria on the other. What are the kind of tests you would set in government, or the tests you would set for what is a legitimate instance of liberal intervention? Yeah, I mean, there are no, a number of things um, that you need in order to have confidence that intervention won't do more harm than good. And let me just say this too, is that this is clearly a question of the implications that military action has across the world and the chain of events that you can spark across the world if you get this wrong. But also, often, when I've had to face a test of military action, there's been another thing in my mind as well. I represent a town where a lot of young people go off to fight and sometimes to die in war. And so this isn't just a question of global politics to me. This is very local and very, very personal. And international law and respecting the rule of law is clearly one of those tests. It's why, as I was saying to Matthew earlier, that I feel extraordinarily troubled by 
the inability of the UK government currently to answer any kind of questions about the basis for US action against Soleimani. But there's another thing as well. When we had to vote on strikes in Syria, I was genuinely open-minded about that. I was in the shadow cabinet at the time. Uh, I don't think I'm betraying any confidence because it was all uh, repeated word for word in The Guardian. But there was a huge row about military intervention in Syria in Labour's shadow cabinet. And I think there were a number of us who felt actually that we had to give Cameron a hearing. There was a case for that intervention and we had to give that a hearing, however difficult and uncomfortable that is in a party that has been so scarred by the legacy of Iraq. But if you cast your mind back to that moment, I think even people who were very, very supportive of those strikes felt deeply troubled at Cameron's inability to really make the case for it. And I am always mindful of the fact that doing nothing has consequences, but so too does doing something. And those strikes which sought to take out infrastructure, which was the right thing to do in order to disrupt those terrorist networks, also would have targeted civilian populations. And the legacy of that we've seen in other countries, where people with whom we ought to be building common cause and empowering in order to enable those pro-democratic uprisings to take place, have seen intervention from the West and have been turned against us and for the authoritarian regime as a consequence. And that was what was forefront in my mind around Syria, and that was the case that I'm afraid, sitting in the House of Commons, listening to the entirety of that statement from David Cameron, that was the case that he just failed to make. Do I regret that? I don't know, is the honest answer. I've wrestled with it a lot, seeing what's happened in Syria since. But these are the sorts of judgment calls that you have to make as a politician, and I just don't think, as a leader, you can shy away from making them. OK, I'm going to take one more round of questions. I, uh, at least you might have to write this down, because I'll just take four okay. or five, because yeah. we're running out of time, and then right. you can just pick the bones out of those four or five. So okay. uh, we'll start with the gentleman at the back. Uh, Ned Simons from HuffPost. Um, you were quite critical of Jeremy Corbyn, the current leadership's approach to Russia. Um, I wondered why you think they took a position they did. Yep. Uh, hello, I'm Canadian, and uh, most of us call uh, our free trade agreements with the U.S. a corporate bill of rights, yep. so um, attention. Um, but I really wanted to ask why you didn't use the phrase Green New Deal. I mean, Bernie Sanders is using it. We're using it a lot in Canada, Naomi Klein. And it, the failure of labor to use that phrase seems pretty, um, well, um, worry, worrisome. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thanks. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, a lady with the pencil. Hi, Lisa. Kate Ferguson from The Sun. You said that. Um, sorry, over here. Oh, great, sorry. <laughs> you said that Britain shouldn't do a trade deal with anybody that's not ratified the Paris Agreement. Are you saying there that if Donald Trump pulls out of the agreement, Britain shouldn't do a trade deal with them? And what would you say to critics who say? Um, They'll say that will harm British economy just for grandstanding on climate change. Okay, and then there's a gentleman here in the front row, and then I'll take the guy who's over there in the corner, and then we'll, we'll have to stop at that. Hi. Um, the last three and a half years have been extremely disruptive in the House of Commons. How does the Labour Party intend to make the House of Commons a more constructive and uh, appealing place for the public to actually see their MPs work? Great, and then, yep. Thank you. Um, Lisa, how are you all from the Daily Telegraph? Sorry, sorry, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, just, just, you were critical of the Labour leadership. You said that on Brexit they'd fallen into a trap set by the Conservative Party. And I just wondered, um, when you say the leadership, do you also have in mind Emily Formbury, Sir Keir Starmer, and Re Rebecca Long-Bailey in that? There we go. So uh, ending up with a nice benign question there yeah. for you, Lisa. <laughs> so... Uh, so, Lisa, one of your extra leadership challenges is to answer five or six very challenging questions in five minutes. Your time begins now. Okay. Um, can I just say, on the, on the question of, of failure, it was a collective failure of the party and of the whole movement. And I, let me say this, too, is that I regret my part in it because I, I could see what was happening with Brexit coming from the day that Cameron called the referendum. And I went to the Shadow Cabinet and I tried to make the case that we would lose that referendum that the campaign was wrong, 
that we didn't understand why people were voting leave and we thoroughly underestimated the number of people who would and I didn't win that argument with my colleagues. I went off and tried to make the case after the referendum was lost for, it, for Labour to engage out there with the public in a national conversation about what must come next. I tried that argument everywhere with my colleagues and I lost. I tried at the beginning of 2019 to persuade Labour colleagues on the front bench that it was a much, much better idea to take the offer that Theresa May was giving us rather than end up here where we are now and to forge a compromise through the middle that accepted that we were leaving the European Union but maintained the economic and political relationship that has been so important for this country in the future and are lost. So I accept my role in this as well, and I think we all have to. Every single one of us in this leadership contest has to accept that Labour has got it wrong and that never again must we be in a position where we end up here. Um, what can we do to make the House of Commons more appealing um, to the public? Well, let me try and launch a bit of a defence of the House of Commons because actually one of the things that I have seen over the last couple of years is Labour, Liberal Democrat, Tory, Green, SNP MPs stepping across party boundaries at a time that in British politics that has become more tribal than I can ever remember to try to do the right thing. And you may disagree with those politicians. A lot of my colleagues, a lot of my constituents disagreed with me actually that negotiating a trade deal was the right thing to do. There were people in the Labour Party who were very, very angry with me for talking to politicians of different parties. But there are people who stood up and shown bravery and shown leadership, even if you don't think that what they've done is right. And I think we need to be better as a political grouping at explaining to people those moments, what happens and why it happens. And I think those moments of leadership have, have been really important for our country. And that level of bravery is the sort of thing that I want to see take us forwards. Um, just on this um, point about doing, not doing trade agreements with countries that have, haven't signed up to the Paris Agreement, I think some of the most inspiring things that I've ever seen are when, whether it's the USA under Obama or uh, the European Union as a trading bloc, have used, and used trade deals in order to drive up standards for people around the world whether that's on climate change, whether that's on human rights, whether that's on LGBT rights. This is what I mean by standing by your values. And that is something that I believe that my constituents in Wigan care about every bit as much as people in other parts of this very diverse country. And when you pose the question about, is this just grandstanding that will harm the British economy in order to make a point? Well, actually, what is the biggest threat that we face to our pensions and our savings and our, the basis of our economy? Ask Mark Carney, it's climate change. So this is not an either or, and I don't accept this false binary. We've got to do both. On this question about a Green New Deal, the reason I didn't use the phrase, if I'm honest, is because it means absolutely nothing to most of my constituents. And I've been around the country for the last few years talking to people about action on climate change. And too often what happens is that when the Labour Party talks about a Green New Deal or when activists in one part of our coalition, say Ballam, talk about a Green Revolution, what people in Bassett Law or Lee or Bolton hear is that my, the power station is closing, I'm going to lose my job and my energy bill is going up. For far too many people in those communities who care deeply about a commitment to the environment, who do want to see real action on climate change. This is seen as an agenda that will take more from them after 40 years of decline. And I think we have to find a way of speaking the same language on this. Because actually, when those activists talk about a Green New Deal, what do they mean? They mean jobs. And they should mean, as the trade union movement rightly says, they should mean jobs in Bassett Law, not just jobs overseas. They mean better buses, the better buses that people in Bolton are desperate for, newer, cleaner, more reliable forms of transport. They mean home insulation. That means that people in Tottenham and people in um, Wrexham will see their energy bills go down. And that's the agenda that Labour has to have. And then that, we've got to find the right language so that we're actually appealing to people on, along a sense of hope rather than a sense of despair. And just finally, 
On Rochelle, I don't know. There's been reams of stuff written about why the Labour leadership took the position that they did. And I, um, you know, I, I left the Shadow Cabinet in 2016, and I can't say that I've been particularly in the inner circle since. But what I do know is that when we chose to show solidarity with Putin rather than the Russian people, we completely and utterly failed to live up to our values. And I never want to see us do that again. Thank you. So... Um Thank you all for coming. If this is your first time at the RSA, please visit the RSA's website to look at the amazing work uh, that we do or consider joining the RSA Fellowship, a global network of 30,000 change makers work working to make the world a better place. Thank you for joining us, but most of all, please thank our wonderful speaker today, Lisa Nandy. Thank you.